Okay, so I'm here with Mr. Rick Newman, president of Puerto Rico Fast Ferries. We're gonna talk about the recent announcement that the government made, specifically the P3 authority regarding the um, selection of a private operator for the ferry systems, um, uh, the ones that connect Puerto Rico with Vieques and Culebra, as well as the, the service that connects San Juan to Cataño and vice versa. So why don't we, why don't you give me your, your point of view on what took place? I understand that you're not exactly happy, right, about the outcome. So why don't we talk about this issue? Because I know that you're, you've been in the, involved in this for a very long time. So it's not like you're coming in new into this situation, right? That's correct. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to your audience and to yourself, uh, Michelle. Uh, as you know, uh, we began uh, back in 2010 uh, to approach the government at a time when the transportation between the islands uh, was having a lot of difficulties. In fact, uh, the National Guard had stepped in to assist them at that time. And my partner and I uh, decided at that time to make an approach to the government. Uh, my partner, Mark Agopian, is from Rhode Island and has been in the ferry business for over 35 years, uh, was a, a co-owner and general counsel for Boston Harbor Ferries, and also the owner of uh, Island High Speed Ferries to Block Island. Uh, in 2005, we met when he brought a boat to Puerto Rico for supplemental service uh, with a contract uh, under the tourism company for a short period of time because of the problem with the transportation. And I met up with him at that time because I was operating uh, and beginning to operate a hotel in Culebra and where I was having tremendous difficulties uh, with the transportation. My experience was horrendous and I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in that project because of the transportation. Not only the irregularity of being able to get our food products to the island, uh, which in some cases we had reservations and the food never made it on the boat. In other cases where our passengers, uh, our guests couldn't uh, get on the boat, so they were they were bumped and, and that therefore cancellations, return of dollars, et cetera. So we had a common interest. He was uh, operating the boat uh, uh, and I was needing uh, a needy rotation. So fast forward to 2010, we joined forces and uh, we began to provide service uh, that nobody had ever dared to do before. On the private sector, uh, over 25, 30 years, there had been problems with the transportation, yet nobody had stepped in to uh, provide a, a solution, and we did. And I must say that it worked uh, beyond anybody's expectation. We were there from 2011, beginning of 2011 to 2014. We were, we were willing to take a chance and we did it. And it turned out to be uh, a, a tremendous uh, exercise uh, that worked for three years. We it were uh, worked, uh, made. It did work. Oh, absolutely. It absolutely worked. We brought in uh, some great boats. Uh, we we had great supervision. And we had a great team of people. We did a lot of training. We hired over almost 45 people uh, locally from that area. Seba, uh, Naguabo, Fajardo, Rio Grande was really great. And uh, we integrated very well with ATM. In fact, it was a great exercise uh, beyond our expectation. So, you know, uh, we we uh, provided the service there. Uh, passengers were happy, the tourists were happy, the businesses were happy, and it worked. And of course, we got to 2014 and, and the government entered into a period when uh, it was hard to find money. And mm -hmm. so unfortunately, they couldn't extend our contract. But come 2018, we were approached again. And uh, this time, uh, it was uh, uh, to provide four vessels. Uh, two high-speed passenger vessels and two uh, cargo vessels, uh, passenger cargo combinations. And this time, the uh, intent of the government was to move from Fajardo to Seba. So we had to integrate ourselves into the Seba, what was going to be the short route, uh, which is the same distance to Culebra, right. but it's uh, some substantially shorter to uh, 
to uh, Vieques, and of course, much more shorter if it were to Mosquito Pier, uh, what they call Rompeolas, as opposed to Isabel Segunda. So it's shorter now than it used to be, but it's not as short as it could be. <clears throat> but anyway, it's worked out to, to be a great exercise. Uh, we brought uh, one boat of 149 passenger directly from the, the, the fabricator uh, in Louisiana here. Uh, Matter of fact, uh, the executive director and the secretary of state of the time uh, helped us take the plastics off the seat. That's how new the boat was. And what was that, what was that, uh, boat? What was that boat? That was it. Was that the, that, the name of that boat? Was the Scudic uh, Explorer? Okay. Uh, and, and Scudic is from the Scudic uh, National Park in in New England. And that's where it got its name. It gave uh, 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 it uh, exclusive service to the people of Vieques. So that, that boat was exclusively on the route uh, to Vieques. And then the Big Cat Express, which was uh, 377 passengers, uh, was on the route to uh, Culebra. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, and, I mean, yeah, exactly to Culebra. And then there were two cargo vessels, one Vieques and one Culebra. Uh, we've replaced the, the, we replaced the Scudic uh, with a sister boat right out of the factory in 2019. One year uh, later, uh, it's, it's the Coastal Explorer. That boat left here at the beginning of September because its contract was not renewed. But it was also a right from the factory to Puerto Rico, brand new. Uh, and uh, again, we took the plastics off the seat and it was an introductory ride, et cetera, et cetera. Again, exclusive uh, to uh, Vieques. Then uh, we had the opportunity to replace the uh, Big Cat Express. So we, we, we uh, exchanged the Big Cat Express for what now is the Julia Lee. The Julia Lee is a 320 uh, passenger high-speed ferry that we're using right now for Culebra. Hopefully in the near future we'll uh, be able to use it both Culebra and Vieques because we're they're they're building some f some fendering that it needs to supply its uh, its uh, service to to Vieques as well. How so much have you that's, invested? How much have you invested in total with uh, you know in all of these vessels? Well, you know, there, there's a, a, a large investment in these boats uh, that, that, that people have made. Uh, we lease the boats from those people. So we, we obviously, in order to get the boats, must pay deposits, letters of credit. Uh, we have to do a substantial amount of investment uh, prior to the boats coming to Puerto Rico so that they can operate properly here. The boat that's here now, the Julia Lee, providing passenger service to Culebra, is 2019 boat. It came here three months after it splashed in the water for the first time. So, you know, Puerto Rico Fast Ferry has the capability to bring new and modern boats uh, to service our needs here. And then we have what's called the uh, Mr. Mason, which is a combo of uh, passengers in cars with the ramp on it that it right now is servicing both islands. Uh, this weekend it, it did exclusive routes to Vieques, but it also uh, does trips to to Culebra. Uh, the point is, is that during this period, the government has seen that privatization works and they have decided to go uh, and, and do privatization. It started first in the previous admin, uh, government administration uh, that uh, RFP never made it. And so uh, this government picked up on it in 2018 and decided to issue an RFP. And the first thing they did was a two-tiered uh, system, which was quite good. Uh, an SOQ or, or, or what's called an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications. And they pre-qualified five companies. I don't know how many started, but five were allowed through the door, basically passed the due diligence and were capable. Uh, there were two companies from the United States, there were two companies from Puerto Rico, and there was one from Spain, uh, Balearia. And then uh, we went through the process, uh, as you can imagine, of conferences, conference calls, uh, in-person uh, site inspections, visits to the islands, etc. And a date was set for the uh, proposal to be turned in and lo and behold to our surprise we later found out that only two companies had participated uh, and 
uh, that process began. We were one of the two companies. Well, and then in, in 2019, <laughs> I wrote this story. I wrote it in, the, in July 2019. I wrote that actually HMS Ferries apparently had been selected way back then. Um, yes. Did, you know, were you aware that this had happened? I mean, we were never officially told. Uh, we, we read about it in the press. And of course, we had a lot of uh, uh, information that came to us through the system. Uh, obviously, we know a lot of Puerto, you know, a lot of people in Puerto Rico, uh, you know, contrary to what people believe, uh, you know, yo soy de aquí. Uh, and mm -hmm. and yeah, people, people are always writing in the blogs about uh, you know, Newman, the gringo that came under Act 20 and so forth and so on. I, I just, for yeah. the record, I'm not an Act 20 or 22. Uh, and and uh, I've lived here all my life. I got here when I was a year and a half old and, and uh, in Pampers and uh, here I am. So, you know, I, I think people mistake that uh, just like they mistake me for being the brother of a, of a senator here. And we don't even spell our names the same. Uh, but you know, they, they asked me about my brother and they asked me about my cousin. Uh, but the fact is, is that our names are spelled differently and we don't have any background that's even remotely. But those mistakes are made. We, we try to correct them when we can. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, we know a lot of people. So the information got to us about HMS, et cetera, et cetera. We know HMS. We know who they are. We know they're big. Uh, we know the owner. Uh, and, uh, you know, we we have no problem with uh, with HMS whatsoever in this whole process. We thought it would be a, a, a good uh, uh, process. Unfortunately, uh, what's transpired is not literally what we thought was going to happen. Which is we, what? What were you expecting? Well, which is, well, we were expecting that it would be a, a, a level playing field, uh, and that uh, even though we're, you know, from Puerto Rico, and there are laws to uh, ensure that uh, you know we are adequately uh, protected uh, to equal the, you know, so we have an equalizer. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it didn't necessarily happen that way. Well, what uh, happened? The first of which was. Well, the bid bond was the first thing, you know, the, the $5 million bid bond, uh, all the companies complained about, uh, it was, it was, uh, something that everybody knew was going to be very difficult to attain. And we asked for it to be reconsidered. Uh, and then the final analysis, they said they would reconsider, uh, but they didn't. And so obviously the big company with all the assets, uh, was able to attain a $5 million bid bond when the local Puerto Rico company uh, was not able to do so, even though they now say and have publicly stated that they had a lot of difficulty, HMS, in finding a bond as well. Uh, so it wasn't so easy for them, but it, you can imagine what it was for us. So it certainly did not uh, uh, look field. You were going to ask a question? And just to be clear, these conditions, just so that everybody understands, these conditions were part of the P3 authorities uh, process, right? To, to find a private operator for the ferry system, right? Yes, it was in the RFP. Okay. Uh, yes, it was in the RFP that a $5 million bond would be required. So we all knew that going in and we all raised questions. All five companies had issues with that, uh, even HMS. Yes, and, and, and HMS, obviously, because of their size, was able to get it. We, we certainly were not. But we did put up a letter of credit from the Banco Popular for a lesser amount to show good faith. But now it turns out that they're claiming that Banco Popular is not an investment grade rated bank. So uh, we've, you know, if, if that's the case uh, and the government does 70 percent of its business with the Banco Popular, uh, it's it's also surprising. I think the other thing that that has now come out uh, in our analysis of this bid is the unfairness of the price. The fact of the matter is uh, HMS is uh, 47 million dollars more in real dollars. Uh, plus the fact that we included two boats uh, uh, that we know had the level of service required, and HMS did not provide boats, $7 million difference. 
uh, there's the fact that in our number, you have almost uh, $25 million worth of charter boats over a period of time uh, that we've included. And now if, if, if they have to provide boats, the government's going to have to then charter or lease boats, which goes on top of the subsidy. So it increases the, the, the gap between us and, uh, and, and I did ask HMS. So, you know, we, we believe I did ask Mr. Miller about the issue of the boats. I asked him if HMS was gonna be using the government's boats and he said yes. And he also said that the government is um, looking to use federal funds um, to be able to add more vessels or newer vessels, right? To, to the, um, the rotation. In your case, you're saying that you were willing to put up your own vessels Include yes, in our, in, our, in our bid numbers, uh, we continued service as it is now uh, with two of our vessels, and, and, and that's built into our numbers. So basically, our number uh, included uh, the two vessels because we're aware uh, du during our due diligence that we did in preparation for the bid, uh, we were aware that we could not meet the performance standards and the trip, the number of trips that were required with the ATM vessels uh, that they have uh, operational. So uh, in our due diligence, we, we saw that there was no choice. You either violate the performance criteria by not being able to, or you put the finger on the government and said, you know, it's your problem. Uh, we're not putting boats. And if you don't get us the boats, uh, you know, uh, you better go out and find boats. And that was going to increase uh, the cost even more. So we, we built it in and, and we were diligent in, in researching that and studying it carefully to make sure we could accommodate. I think, you, you, you know, the, the, the three years uh, of design and construction of a vessel and delivery of vessel is accurate. Uh, we have talked to some of the consultants that have been uh, 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 invited to participate in the RFP for the design and construction of those boats because obviously, you know, we're known in the industry. So they have contacted us to ask us questions about their bid and ask us questions regarding the, the, the type of vessels that we believe are adequate uh, and needed to provide the service. As an insider, obviously they have that information from from the P3 and, and the authority as well. But it, it, we know it takes three years. so. You know, the question is, what happens in, in, in two scenarios? What happens, number one, uh, between now and the time the government boats get back from wherever they're at being repaired? Mm -hmm. And the second part is, you know, will those be enough uh, to be able to bridge till the new boats get here, uh, assuming that, you know, the government is able to get its federal funds approved and, and get the, an RFP approved and get uh, 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 the, the, the bids from a fabricator uh, shipyard to fabricate them before they actually get into production and get built and delivered here. These are big boats and they're heavy and they're, they're, they're significant. So, you know, you, you don't, you don't order those from a shelf. Uh, right. So in essence, uh, you know, we, we calculated that, I think so. So there are two things here. One is prima facie right on the, you know, we are, $47 million less. And in addition to that, we have two boats in there that have a value of about 25 million in charter value, uh, at least over the next five years included in our number. So if we were to win the bid had, and, and be grant, we, we, would, we would continue as we are now. Uh, we don't have to worry about vessels. We have the two government vessels working and our two vessels, and we're satisfied that we can keep those working and provide the service levels to meet the performance standards uh, that were established. You mentioned something there, service. You know that it has been a historical issue with the ferry system that the, the service, the level of service, at least for passengers, hasn't been up there. Um, breakdowns, of difficulty in buying tickets. You buy a ticket that doesn't necessarily guarantee you'll get on the boat, uh, you know, and on and on and on. So, you know, how were you proposing to fix that? Because you've been involved in, you know, the ferry service. So how would you have fixed that? What were you proposing? We were proposing to operate uh, the vessels differently. I think that, you know, these are operational 
additional uh, requirements. Uh, you know, boats have to rest, motors have to cool down. Um, uh, the vessels can't be run metal to the pedal day in and day out to service the needs of the island. And, and so that there has to be some downtime. There has to be adequate uh, preventive maintenance on all these boats. So they're very delicate and they're operating in salt water conditions, uh, which even makes them worse. So, uh, it, you know, a lot of it is in the care of the vessel. In addition to that, you know, our relationship with the mechanic shops uh, are, are excellent. Uh, we work with Cummins, we work with Antilles uh, uh, Power. They, they are the MTU dealers here uh, for the Detroit diesel engines and the MTU engines. And we deal with Caterpillar on the Caterpillar engines. And we don't have trouble having them come out at night on the weekends. Uh, our, our payment history with them is excellent to the point where, you know, they know they're going to get paid. Uh, we're willing to pay overtime when it's necessary. We're willing to ship parts in overnight and pay for the freight when it's necessary. So, you know, we, we know how to deal with that. Uh, preventive maintenance on these boats is key to keep them, them operating. It's also our operating style uh, is different than ATMs. We have uh, a, a particular captain operating the boat all day. Okay, uh, you know, oftentimes they rotate their captains. So on a on on their day, they may have two, three different captains, and then tomorrow two other captains. Each one operates the vessel differently. We have two week rotations, so you know the, they work two weeks, and then they have a period off, and then they come back two weeks later. You know, these these are things we also uh, have a checklist, uh, much like a, an airplane pilot's checklist where every day certain things are done. Uh, we wash down the boats every day. We clean out strainers every day and so forth. So, you know, we, we, we've been around in the industry. We've operated here for over five years. We've moved almost 3 million passengers, several hundred thousand vehicles. Uh, you know, my partner has been in the business for 35 years. He's moved millions and millions of passengers. So we're accustomed to that type of operation. Let me ask you something because, and just so that I understand, you had a contract with the MTA, but were you working separately from them? I mean, were you- No, we, service no, 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 we worked. Were you servicing their vessels also as well or, or who was responsible? No, for no, no. So no, they're, they're responsible for their vessels. I'm not, I'm not understanding. It seems like there were two separate but parallel operations happening or no. No, we're integrated. Uh, we're, we're providing a supplemental service with our boats and our crews. So basically, we're responsible for manning the boat uh, from top to bottom, captains, engineers, and, and crew members, wow. our boats, we're and they have their people for their boats. We're responsible for repairs and maintenance on our boats. They're responsible for maintenance on theirs. They sell tickets. We don't sell tickets. Wow. They board our passengers, meaning, meaning they're responsible uh, for everything until the, the passenger boards the boat. They take the ticket from the passenger at the gate and the passenger boards the boat. Then he becomes a shared responsibility because he's still their passenger because they, the, the, the passenger bought the ticket from ATM. But we're responsible for transporting for the safety, the care of that person to ensure he has proper customer service on the trip. As part of your proposal, uh, for the P3 uh, transaction, you were saying that you could take care of all of it. Yeah, it, 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 the, the P3 process was that you, you take care over the whole operation, mm -hmm. including the leases, of the subleases uh, that, that ATM has, uh, their boats, the maintenance of their boats, the care. Uh, their employees, uh, you know, which we have an excellent relationship with. Uh, he, 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 basically, the responsibility is sort of like this airport situation where basically uh, ATM becomes an overseer and the, the responsibility for conducting the operations and maintenance rests on, on, the, on the operator. And we have done that before, as I have told you. Uh, we are anxious to do it. We know what needs to be done. Probably nobody knows the system better than we know it. Um, and, you know, they'll learn it over time if, if that happens. But the fact is that we know the system. I think there's another thing here that 
that plays into this. And that is you know, when they told us that we were not uh, uh, selected or that they gave a, an ex a reason last week in the media why we were not selected was based on two items. The first one was the bid bond that we failed to post it, and I've explained that. The other one was that we didn't have a firm fixed price, uh, and our price was a variable, and they were looking for a fixed price. The fact of the matter is, in, in any business person's logic, uh, you would know that you can't predict uh, going into the future, 8, 10, 15, 20 years. This is a 23-year contract. So what we put in our bid, when we bid, is what's called a true up, true down, meaning that you do an audit, and if the numbers for fuel, insurance, et cetera, go up, ATM pays the difference. If the numbers go down, you have a, they have a credit, so right. they, they benefit. That's a fair way of doing these kind of contracts. It's not unusual. We do it in hotels. We do it in other types of businesses because that way the buyer and the service provider are on an equal plane. If you don't do that, then what happens is if fuel now goes to $4, ATM is going to pay more than what they contracted for through mm -hmm. HMS. That in effect makes the subsidy a variable. If insurance your next year or five years from now goes up, they're going to go to ATM and ask them for the difference. They've written that contract that way. That makes it variable, meaning that you cannot predict what the true cost and subsidy is going to be today for five years out. We covered that and they took points off and they disqualified that portion of our financial bid based on the fact that we weren't fixed. HMS gave a fixed number. But in the negotiation, it became a variable number. What, okay. you know, como decimos aquí, lo que es igual. No es verdad. You know, exactamente. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in, in essence, it's now turned out that HMS has a variable cost contract for something that we were disqualified for, for having a, a, a variable cost contract. Well, let me tell you something. It's been announced that they were chosen. Um, yes. Can you do something about it? Will you do something about it? Are you going to contest this decision? What's next for you? In all of the letters uh, between us and the P3 authority, uh, they have always told us that we have, and, and all those letters have a standard uh, paragraph at the end, citing the law and the and the rights that one has to protest the, bill, the, the, the bid. Uh, we have attorneys now that are studying that to determine uh, if that you know, is, is worth pursuing or not. We don't know if we are, but we certainly are looking into it. But we have three issues here, uh, which, you know, it, which are being now dissected. We have some other ancillary that we haven't decided whether or not they're significant enough. But one is cost. Puerto Rico has been in bankruptcy uh, for some time now. Uh, we've been in a recession for 13 years, and uh, we can't be overspending. And if you have a qualified bidder who made the, SO, the SOQ or the RFQ process and became a qualified bidder, because if we weren't qualified, that was the time to get us out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only issue, the bond, they should have looked for a way to, to, over, to overcome that. All we have asked since July 1st, when we got the letter where they selected another company, is there were two of us. For the best possible opportunity for the Puerto Rico people and the cost and the service, why not bring us both to a table, negotiate with both of us simultaneously, and use one against the other to get the best deal you can. I, I do this every day in my business. And as you know, you know, I've turned around three hotels. I bought the, the Verdanza Hotel after eight years of abandonment with asbestos and lead paint. And we did a total turnaround and it went on our 19th year. I did the same thing with what's now the Intercontinental Hotel. We took it when it was on the, on the doorstep of the bankruptcy court and we did a turnaround. And we did the same thing with the Ritz-Carlton. We actually purchased the Ritz-Carlton when it was in bankruptcy 
and we turned it around. So we know what crisis is. We know what financial crisis is. We know what value engineering is. And we know what market engineering is from a marketing and sales perspective. So our, our position is, is that there is no reason for them to go into a sole source contract, which is what they did, negotiate variables that were not given to us to be able to compete with. So a variable uh, pricing that now is going to cost them close to 60 million more than what we would have cost them to, 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 to pay. Uh, it's dependent on federal funds uh, arriving. If the federal funds don't arrive, then uh, the government has to pay the difference in the subsidy. In our proposal, we didn't count on federal funds because we knew that the probability of getting federal funds is not always there. Sometimes you get them and sometimes you don't. So the bottom line is you can't count on them. So don't put it in your bid. Make the business happen, okay, without it. If it comes, it's to the benefit of ATM because if they know it's going to pay $30 million for this service, but if they can get $5 million from the U.S. government, then it only costs them 25. Mm -hmm. But if I say to them, you know, you're, I'm only going to charge you 25, but, you know, or, or, or uh, you know, you're going to pay the difference if you don't get the $5 million federal funds, then ATM has to plan on that. That makes it a variable. So that the, 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 the fact that the $2 million that we feel is somewhat discriminatory against all the laws that, you know, are, are here to Wait, help Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Huh? What's a million? I missed that. No, the five million. I'm sorry, oh, the, the five, five million dollar button. Okay. So yes. the variables, the five million, and what's the third issue? The, the, the five million, you have the the variable. the variable cost versus the fixed yeah. cost in the proposal, but then in the in the contract, they both ended up being variable costs because the, the HMS bid is a variable cost. It's variable for fuel, variable for insurance, variable for federal funding. Okay. And, and th those are two very, very significant components to what's happening right now. You mentioned there were three. three issues. Well, there's the fact that we, you know, because, because we did our due diligence, uh, we know that the system needs the supplemental vessels to continue uh, you know, if without those vessels, how are they going to meet performance criteria? Uh, they don't have it built into their number. Uh, they would have to go back to the government and say, hey, you didn't give me the boats you said you were going to give me. So you're responsible for that. Go, go, go find boats. We're, we anticipated that. So theoretically, when you look at the true scenario that we're at now, our bid is by far better. Okay. And, and the fact that after the evaluation was done, certain things happen is unfair because those things that happen should have been provided to us so that we could have an opportunity, Fine. the same as they, to make the changes. So, you know, we, our, our position is Puerto Rico is going to spend more to get less than what they could have gotten with us. Let me ask you, how much time do you have? Is there... Um a period of time that you have to present your, you know, your, your protest or, you know, your, your concern about not being chosen. Yes. There, the, the, from the date of notification, uh, we have 20 days. Uh, so literally we have, uh, uh, another seven or eight days left. Uh, you know, we obviously on Friday received, uh, copies of all the documents and our attorneys uh, and our, our, our team have been working all weekend going through those documents to see where the, 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 the concerns are, uh, the differences between the bid and the contract, the differences between what we were scored negatively on uh, and what's now turned out that they should have had the equal score. If you were to score them again today based on price, 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 Okay, because remember, the RFP was issued on whoever lowers the subsidy, price, mm -hmm. price, price, because there was no issue here with qualifications because everybody was pre-qualified. So, so price, price, price. We now know that their price is much more. Okay, having done due diligence, we did due diligence. They apparently did not because they felt that they could re rely on the government to provide the votes. Obviously, that's not happening. And the fact that you know there should have been an equalizer. 
to equalize the $5 million bond because otherwise you're discriminating against the local company who has little access to that type of bond. It, it really, you know, if, if that were the case, a lot of bids in Puerto Rico, a lot of, uh, you know, would, would go to outside companies because, you know, it, we, we have no access to those kind, you know, especially the PMAs, the, the, you know, we just don't have access to that kind of facility. We went to the bond market. Don't think we didn't try. And, and we were frustrated by it. And we told the government we were frustrated by it. And we asked them to reconsider a lower amount. They didn't do it. Okay, let me let me play devil's advocate here. Let's say that it doesn't change, that they remain um, with their decision and their choice of HMS ferries. Could you compete as a private operator with the government no. to provide service? No. No, nobody can compete with that. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. no, because, you know, when you look at the cost of, of operating a vessel, the manpower required by the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, the insurance costs, uh, the re repair costs on these boats. I mean, I just paid $40,000 for a repair on one, one engine uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, very expensive. And, and uh, you're competing against uh, $2 and 225 uh, fair to those islands that have been in place for since 1988 uh, and and you know even if it goes up to you know 11 25 which is the rate they're saying and you know the red you know the fact of the matter is is that you wouldn't have enough revenues to make it remember there are many trips that you have on schedule that oftentimes uh, you have very few passengers. I mean, uh, you know, it's not unusual for ATM to run the Cayo Blanco, which is 600 passengers with 50 passengers, you know, on six, on a 600 and you're, you're, you're spending all the crew, crew time and you're spending the fuel for that big boat to just take 50 people. Well, you know, it, it the, the fuel and the labor, if you took 50 people on one of our boat, I mean, we, we would lose tons of money on that trip. It just can't be, you know, so as a constant, yeah, it's just not economically viable. And don't think, by the way, that we have it run over the years, uh, 20 different models. Uh, we, we've listened to the people of Vieques who have had ideas. We've taken their ideas, put them into the computer, uh, into a model to see if they would work. We just can't figure out, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars just for the insurance. Uh, it, the fact that you're running uh, lightweight, aluminum, uh, high speed ferries. You have everything going against you. You have the speed, you have the lightness of the vessel, you have the fact that it's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, aluminum, light aluminum. That's what makes it fast, okay? And, and so you have, you have a risk, you, 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 you have to insure that risk. And so, you know, it's expensive. So the, these, these are all things that have to be taken into consideration. By the way, we, we also were going to provide uh, in our bid, we have much like, like they have, uh, we all recognize, uh, all, all five companies recognize the need for a new ticketing system. And the ticketing system is antiquated. The software it is hard to, to Honestly, you know, it's, it's passe. You know, this has to be something modern and up to date with, uh, with, uh, with scanners and barcodes and uh, advanced yeah. reservations and advanced yeah. ticketing. Yeah. You have to have an app. You know, yeah. I mean, everybody has an app, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so you, you, you know, you, you got to get with it. And, and certainly we, uh, we researched it and we talked to some of the biggest companies uh, around and we got a very detailed bid uh, and we worked, we had, we hired consultants to help us ensure that every component of the bid is proper to be able to run the right service. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars, not only the software, but the mechanical components of selling the tickets, scanning the tickets, the web and the modernization, it's an ongoing uh, software modification that has to be done as the evolution of computerization and intelli uh, artificial intelligence operate. The other thing that we have, and, and you know this, uh, you know, <laughs> we run independent hotels. You know, mm -hmm. I ran... The, the, the Sands Hotel and Casino is an independent. The San Juan Grand as an independent. The Verdanza is an independent. And we compete against all the big brands, Hilton and Marriott's and, mm -hmm. and you name it, okay? 
we are here because we're good at marketing. We are here because we know social networking. We are here because we know sales and we know what it takes to build a sales organization that puts the volume in that we need to sustain ourselves against all the big boys. We have that same marketing concept designed for the ferries because one of the opportunities that the ferries have is to overcome the price increase. If there is a price increase where people now go for $2 and it's going to cost them eleven twenty-five, So now you've taken that family that, that of four people that go spend the day, it costs them $16 round trip to spend a day in, 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 in you know, on the islands. Now you're going to take it and you're, they're going to, they're, they're going to pay, you know, $80. Okay. I mean, so, so, you know, over $80. So, so automatically, if you were moving 350 vi uh, uh, visitors, 400,000 visitors, you're going to have a diminishing number of travelers. You have to make that up somehow. You have to do marketing. You have to, you have to do packaging. You have to find creative ways of. You have to work, of, of, have to work with the of, visitors in the islands to be able to. You had to work with, with bundling, mm -hmm. okay, the products, the car rentals and the hotel with the, with the trip. We have to, you know, all of that has to be integrated like we do with the airlines in our marketing plans. We integrate with the airlines. We buy tickets from, from at, at, you know, all the airlines and we package them into opaque rates. We know how to do that. And we know because if you don't do that, it doesn't matter that you increase the rate to 1125. The fact of the matter is you're going to have a diminishing number of passengers traveling and you're, you're going to have a diminishing number of visitors going there to buy ice cream and to the, use excursions and, and taxi cabs. The thing is that if I'm going to pay 1125, I expect a certain level of service and I expect a certain level of reliability. And that has to be guaranteed in that 1125. Um, Correct. That's just a given. Let me ask a quick question. Um, you have a relationship right now with the MTA, right? You're providing service yes. to your vessels. How long is that agreement in place? Um, and, you know, how long are you willing to, to is there a transition period is what I want to ask. You know, you know I, I it, it, as as the MTA has has told us uh, for the last two and a half years, one thing has nothing to do with another. I never have never have had a conversation with them regarding uh, the 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 P three uh, uh, RFP. Uh, you know, our, our relationship is very professional. I consider them professionals. Uh, they they know their business. We know our business. Okay, and what I, what I need to ask is how long will you be sticking yeah. around? You know what I mean? How, how long? Well, I, well, our boat, the contract for the for the high speed ferry passenger boat, uh, comes up in January, and the other one comes up in February. So I would assume that uh, you know the the Pedro Pierluisi administration transition team will start to look at that. Uh, you know we're. We're open and available to extend those contracts uh, to add to them if they need additional boats. Uh, you know the relationship with ATM I consider very professional. I, I had you know a, a, a exchange today back and forth about you know planning the future with one particular boat to service Vieques, uh, the Julia, which has serviced only Culebra, but we think it can go to Vieques in between. And so you know we have to do some coordinating there. But uh, you know the relationship is good, and I think that the uh, the P three process has nothing to do with our supplemental service, which basically just fills in for the fact that you know they don't have enough vessels to be able to provide the service that they need to provide. Right, right. Okay, well, um, you know, let's see what happens and what you decide to do ultimately, you know, as part of this P3 um, deal. I mean, it, it remains to be seen how quick they will be signing a contract with HMS because that hasn't happened yet. As far as, as, far as we know, that hasn't happened yet. Because I, I, I don't, I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I, I the way they're promoting it. I, 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 okay. I asked Mr. Miller last week and he said that they were still ironing out, you know, some kinks. 
So I'm not sure if they if they signed it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think they, you know, the way they're the, the, they're communicating, it would lead us to believe that you know the contract signed uh, that triggers, you know, our notification triggers our period of time in which we can review this. Uh, you know, in our review, we found the things I've told you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, we know the people at HMS. We we have you know no problem with working with them. We have no problem with working with ATM. Uh, but you know, they you need to see, stop thinking, start thinking about how they're going to provide enough transportation because they just sent two boats off last weekend. I have no idea when those are going to come back, but it won't be tomorrow. It's not going to be soon. Those boats have a lot of work, millions of dollars of work to be done. And they have well, the one boat that is down out of service right now, waiting for some a mechanical part. Uh, they need us and you know, we would love to continue on. We have no but, problem with But know, then your, your, your agreement, if you were to extend your contract, it would be with the MTA or would it be with HMS? Oh, I think we froze. Hi. You know, guarantee the payment. I don't think that in in HMS's numbers they have I, I uh, need, a, a number for I need chartering. Mr. Jones, I need to ask you that question again because it completely froze. So my question was. Would your contract, if you were to extend the contract, would it be with the government or would it be with HMS? I assume it would be with the government because that's who our contract is with now. So if you extend the contract, it would be with ATM plus ATM is the one that has to guarantee the payment for the, mm -hmm. the, the vessels uh, because I don't believe that HMS uh, has the funds in their contract to pay us. Okay. Uh, well, I also think that, you know, uh, there's a transition period in there that's important to Michelle. Uh, HMS is not going to start immediately. And, 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 and you know, that transition is going to be over time if they're, if they prevail. And in that time, uh, they're going to have to uh, work together with ATM side by side. Uh, but they'll need vessels. ATM will need the vessels because they have to provide the ongoing service. So, you know, we're hopeful. Our relationship is good. No, anima no animosity with anybody. I mean, we're just exercising our rights based on what we've seen. It would certainly, and I ask you, I mean, it, it would potentially create a crisis um, having fewer vessels available, right, for transportation? Or is passenger traffic down so much that it would yeah, make I, I, No. No, passenger passenger traffic is down from normal times. We're running our the vessels at fifty percent because of the COVID protection. Uh, and but the fact of the matter is that even with the, the COVID, there's substantial amount of traffic going back and forth, uh, mostly residents. But now there's a little bit of tourism, as you know, tourism opened up on Culebra, so there's a little bit more traffic. Uh, you know, and and there's a there's a requirement by the, and you've seen it in in the, in the social media in the last week or so, you know, the people of Vieques are complaining about a lack of, of transportation. And, and so there's a need. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate that the ATM boats are out of service uh, for, for, for mechanical purposes, but those things happen. You know, we could be out of service tomorrow with a vessel because, you know, just like a car, these vessels get a beating and, the and they problem, break down. The problem. You know, and, and that's the way it is. I, I have to tell you uh, something that I think is important, and that is I, I have to reach out to all our employees. Uh, we have right now uh, about 48 employees working for us in SABA. Uh, we have not had one positive case of COVID uh, since the pandemic began in March 15th. Uh, and and, and I, I must tell you that uh, I commend them for being disciplined at home, disciplined in their leisure time, and disciplined on the boats to maintain the protocols beyond a reasonable expectation uh, so that we can avoid anybody uh, getting uh, contaminated. Uh, and we don't want contagion to happen on our boats. And, and I'm proud of the fact that we've been able to do that to our supervision, our management, and our captains, and our engineers, and everybody on the boat. It's, it's, it's really a feat to go 10 months in this scenario and not have one positive. All right, so I guess the next thing remains to be seen whether you will litigate, right? 
um, contest the outcome of that P3 um, choice, um, please keep us posted. Um, it's important to I talk will. on this. Yeah. And in the I, I don't like that word. Uh -huh. I don't like that word litigate. I, I think it's exercise our rights under under the P3 Act that allows us to to review and based on that to to file uh, our, our, our protest. We feel we have grounds, but it's not really a litigation. We, you know, we, we, we present this, there's no discovery, there's no witnesses. It's all on the facts of, of the documents. All right, well, again, let's see what happens. Um, we'll keep each other posted. Um, I'm always all ears. So we definitely, we'll speak again and see what happens with this. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for the opportunity to explain this. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good night.